So, welcome to our session today. Uh, I must admit feeling tremendously excited, uh, both on a personal level and a spiritual level, and I'm looking to discover some wonderful answers to all of the wrestlings of my soul today. <laughs> uh, our world right now feels fractured. We're seeing a rise in nationalism. We're seeing divisiveness around political discourse at the societal levels. We're seeing difficult conversations, a sense of tribalism emerging in many parts of the world. The question of today, what is the role of faith in helping us heal those wounds, heal the fractures that many societies are experiencing right now? And we have the wonderful opportunity today to hear from really some of the world's leading experts and faith leaders who are going to hopefully, you know, certainly share some insights into that domain. Uh, so let me start by just introducing in alphabetical order our distinguished uh, discussants for today. So first, we have Ms. Bonnie Dougal of the Baha'i International Community, and she's the principal representative to the UN. Second, we have Ms. Christina, Christiana Figueres, who is convener of Mission 2020 and former executive secretary of the UN Convention on Climate Change. We also have Dr. Brian Grimm, who is president of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen, who's president of Zaituna College and vice president of the Forum for Promoting Peace. And we also have with us His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Kodwo Turkson, who's, the, who's of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development at the Vatican. So we have an extremely distinguished and thoughtful group of leaders with us today. So let's jump right into the conversation. How can faith guide us in dealing with and healing the societal fractures that we're experiencing in many parts of the world? Uh, and your eminence, might we start with you to hear some thoughts on that? Thank you, and uh, welcome all of you. I think, I think uh, you know, faith helps us navigate and helps us mend all of these by providing us with the basic underlying principles. The basic underlying principles of human life and basic underlying principles of society living and all. I mean, so being a Christian and therefore uh, making the Bible and its account of creation as a point of departure, creation basically establishes the fact that humanity is a family. It belongs to a family, and that it is, uh, its variegated forms are based on the principle of brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Fraternity is the one thing that was created by God on the basis of which humanity spread. So uh, belonging and therefore guided by brotherhood, humanity belongs together. And belonging together, the first offense against humanity was a fratricide. A brother killing a brother. That can happen, but it's a fratricide. It's a brother diminishing, diminishing his life as a brother by eliminating a brother. So uh, the principles which bind us together is just this. Having a common father, we all one of a family. One of a family meant to live together. We call to coexist in the pursuit of a common good as brothers. Having this as basic principles, we can go and develop other, you know, whenever there are challenges, that the principle of solidarity would want to bring us all back together. The principle of appeal for a common good, and the fact that everything that God has created was meant to make us all happy, universal destination of the goods of the earth. All of these become principles that help us mend whatever fractured relationship can, you know, result in our various experiences in life. But essentially, the faith of religion is to provide this basic background of principles that describe what we are as a family and as you know, uh, people living together, called to live together in pursuit of our common good. Yes. So the, the family is the basic fabric the basic, really. holding us together. If one should, if divisiveness, if divisiveness should erupt, wait a minute, we're family. And you start right. with that as the basic principle. That's what we are. Thank you. What's your perspective, Bonnie? So the purpose of religion and, um, is to unite. Uh, 
people. And uh, we, from the Baha'i uh, perspective, believe that all uh, the manifestations of God were sent to earth to bring unity, to build upon each other's the previous messages and to bring new truth to mankind as mankind matures to receive it. And we are possibly in an age where humankind is at its stage of adolescence and we are seeing those tendencies playing out, the tendencies that are associated with adolescence and the uncertainties in others. Unfortunately, the narrative that is playing out is this, there are these corrosive narratives about uh, <clears throat> the world is falling apart and, and um, there's very little that can be done and mankind cannot live in peace and you know the conflict is going to be the nature of... And I think as um, the, the different uh, religions and the faith groups and those that believe are really the ones that can bring about this sense of unity and a better understanding <laughs> of what is the purpose of faith, what is the purpose of religion? The true nature of religion is to unite and, and to um, inspire their congregants, the individuals they work with, to rise to that higher level and to, um, to, to build communities, strong communities at the grassroots levels, communities that are resilient, that can withstand these fractures and the forces that are, um, you know, impacting societies that are causing those fractures. We also believe in uh, the equality, and I think all religions speak of equality, but I think that equality has to be at all levels. The equality of women and men is a very important principle for us, and until we can realize that and advance the role of girls alongside that of boys, we will not have the united, the strong uh, community that's required mm -hmm. to, um, to mend those fractures. And the same thing goes for economic security as well. So um, this magic doesn't happen just automatically, uh, just by saying that there's religion or faith in a community. We have to work and we have to uh, think very critically as to what are the structures that need to be re-examined. Because uh, often we hear people say, oh, if only we were to educate the people. But I think some of the educational systems themselves are flawed and need re-examination. And again, we've heard it from world leaders just a little while ago, but others as well throughout the forum. The role of the media is one that we need to uh, examine. And I think the media itself needs to do an examination as to the role it can provide alongside religious actors. Yes. Because often it is a religious media too that can sometimes perpetuate these mm -hmm. narratives that I think we can over time. Gotcha. So ultimately it's once again looking at a set of values, unity, resilience and community, uh, equality and then looking at how those can be applied both at the personal level and at the structural level. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, and let's turn next to uh, Sheikh. All right, um, Bismina, well, the first thing I think it's important to, uh, we, we talk about the terms like faith and, and often don't define them, and faith obviously has dictionary meanings. One of them is just belief without any proof. And there's a lot of people that that's how they view faith. In fact, a lot of skeptics and secularists think the people of faith are simply they just have no proof and they're believing and it's irrational. Mm -hmm. But there's also reasonable faith. And I think most of our traditions actually are founded in reasonable faith. Everybody this morning got up with reasonable faith that they were going to make it to the Congress mm -hmm. Center. We got on airplanes with reasonable faith that that pilot knew what he was doing, that Boeing knew what they were doing when they put it together. Mm -hmm. Basically, everything we're doing is faithful. I mean, we have immense faith. We had faith in our teachers when they told us mm -hmm. that uh, 5 times 5 is 25. We have faith in uh, Klaus Schwab, that uh, he's a good organizer and this thing's all going to work out. So faith is just part of life. 
reasonable faith, you know, there's a lot of unreasonable people. It's probably wise maybe to ask your spouse where you fare on that. <laughs> um, but uh, faith is just part of life. And, yeah. and how we uh, bring faith into a type of reasonableness. Yes. In terms of healing the world, the world has always been fractured. Uh, the Jewish tradition has tikkun olam, which is the idea of healing a fractured world. Um, in the Islamic tradition, there's a verse in the Quran that says, do not corrupt the earth after we have made it whole for you. So, so humans have the capacity to actually create an immense amount of fraction. Now, fracture is interesting because we, we have a mathematical term, fraction. And if we want to add fractions, we have to find common denominators and bring those. Uh, that, that's the way we bring things together. So, and, and also to reduce to get things down, a kind of Occam's razor, down to what are the fundamental problems on the planet? Mm -hmm. And if I was gonna identify the fundamental problem, I would say it's arrogance. Mm -hmm. You know, human beings need to learn humility mm -hmm. uh, towards one another. And then I, I totally agree with uh, His Eminence, uh, the, the Cardinal, that family is at the root of it. And families are dysfunctional. Part of the reason why we have dysfunctional families is to learn how to live with people we don't agree with, right? I mean, everybody has the uncle that nobody wants to come to the holiday, but he still comes, and we kind of deal with it. And so that's part of just learning to live together. We are a human family, mm -hmm. and, and having contempt for others is a major problem. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, in conclusion, our, our, our prophet said, uh, none of you will enter paradise until you have faith. And he said, but you will not have faith until you love one another. Mm. He said, can I tell you something that if you practice it, you will come to love one another. And then he said, spread peace. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's turn to you now, Christiana. You have led tremendously complicated negotiations over incredibly important <laughs> issues in our world and the sustainability of our world. How does faith fit into the work you do? Well, you know, I come at this from uh, the realization that we have not just reached planetary boundaries, we have overstepped them. And once you realize that, you begin to say, so what is the consequence of that? And you begin to understand that what I was taught as a young child, as a young woman, as the definition of the zero-sum game, in which what you win is my loss and what I win is your loss, frankly, doesn't have a place anymore. Because if you have reached and overstepped planetary boundaries, mm -hmm. the fact is either we all win or we all lose together. Yeah. That's the new interpretation of zero sum. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that understanding that we frankly all have to win together, which was at the basis of the development and the delivery of the Paris Agreement, where 195 nations came together, together, not just the governments, but all of the sectors. The spiritual leaders were there all the time. Mm -hmm. The scientists, there was not a fraction between science and religion. Mm -hmm. The business people were there, the NGOs people were there, because we came to understand through a very difficult and complex dialogue mm -hmm. that we're all in this one planet together. Yes. And that if there's anything that is gonna move us forward, it's solidarity. Mm -hmm. So the, the main lesson I think that I had from that is as we rise, we converge. Mm -hmm. Because as we rise in our awareness mm -hmm. of our deep humanity, of, our, of the divine in us, of the spiritual in us, of the best of the human in us, that's where we converge. That is what we have in common. Mm -hmm. And in as much as we reflect that and live with that, then solidarity comes as a natural next step. Mm -hmm. And then agreements are also a natural next step. Yes. <laughs> and, and agreements can stick, Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, or they can start to, or some countries can drop out of these agreements. How did you engage faith communities in dealing with some of these kinds of complications? The faith communities were there, uh, actually, and, and were just, you know, I am truly grateful. Laudato Si, of course, is, uh, is the most famous, but is not the only. The Baha'i community, the, the um, Muslim community, everybody was there, uh, the Buddhist community, and truly supporting this process uh, very, very deeply in addition to all of the other uh, communities and the other sectors. And that is why 
the Paris Agreement is a strong agreement. Mm. It cannot mm. be fractured, to use your word, which I actually don't like. Um, it cannot be questioned by one person sitting in any particular house uh, because it came, it rose out of a higher consciousness of humanity. And therefore, it is not prone to mm. electoral cycles. It will be with us for a much longer time. Mm -hmm. And it is, in fact, without wanting to minimize the difficulty of the Paris Agreement and of the world coming together on climate change, a job which we have not finished, by the way, and we must finish. But I very fundamentally believe that it was the first very successful effort that humanity made to truly address a global issue that needs a global solution. Mm -hmm. It is definitely not the last. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have biodiversity to deal with. We have poverty. We have water. We have migration. Mm -hmm. We have food security. The list goes on and on mm -hmm. about global issues that we will all face mm -hmm. in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we came to an agreement on climate, which we're still implementing, is, I think, humanity's gym. We're just at the gym of strengthening our muscle, mm -hmm. of rising and converging with each other. Right. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. And Brian, we are here at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> yes. In other words, uh, there is a business perspective to faith as well, or there's at least some relationship between the two. Can you help us understand more about that? Yeah, so the, the connection between uh, faith and the economy is that when people give each other freedom, religious freedom, to uh, be who they are, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you respect the other person to be who they are, mm -hmm. uh, that creates a society that's good for sustainable business. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have that condition, you have a conflict economy. Right. So it's a very clear connection. And um, so there's a connection between religious freedom in society and business. I'll give one example. Mm -hmm. uh, a president of Rajawali Corporation in Indonesia uh, had his employees come to him and say, we can't get our children into school or get health care. Mm -hmm. And they were missing work. And so large corporation, and his, a lot of people were having this problem. He said, well, why not? They said, well, our, we don't have a birth certificate for our children. Mm -hmm. Why not? We're not married. <laughs> why not? Mm -hmm. Well, in Indonesia, you have to be married in a religious ceremony mm -hmm. and get a government certificate. Mm -hmm. The religious ceremony uh, requires a dowry and uh, a large party. It's too expensive for them. And the government uh, bureaucracy just doesn't have the forms on hand to give the wedding licenses. Right. So people just don't do it. Mm -hmm. But they can't get the birth certificate. Their children can't get schooling or health care. So he said, let's do something about it. Mm -hmm. And he's a Catholic mm -hmm. in a Muslim-majority country. Mm -hmm. And he had the freedom to contact the Muslim leaders, the Buddhist leaders, the Hindu leaders, Christian leaders, bring them all together and have a mass wedding for thousands of couples. <laughs> and they had a big party, business paid for it. Mm -hmm. And then the government made sure the bureaucrats were there to stamp <laughs> the papers. And he's done this three times, yeah. marrying 5,000 couples at a time. And now the government has said, we have a problem. They, 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 he estimates there's 40 million children in Indonesia without a birth certificate. Mm. So mm. that's the connection. Mm. So imagine the economic drain there is on society when the kids can't get educated and they can't get health care. Mm -hmm. And then when you have the freedom, see, I think of religious freedom as uh, the freedom to do good, setting your, mm -hmm. your faith impulses mm -hmm. free and giving that space to do good in society. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what... Uh, Junardi, Y.W. Junardi did in Indonesia. Right. Great. <laughs> Let's go a step deeper. And, uh, individuals have divisions within us, as the, the Sheikh pointed out a bit earlier before we, we came on stage. Uh, but institutions do as well. And each of the institutions represented here in this room, as with any religious institution, can have points of division. And these institutions have indeed stood the, withstood the test of time. Right. How do your institutions, and I, I, I'm curious, three of you, and then perhaps your reflections as well, how do your institutions understand conflict and division? How do they deal with it in, in ways that really get to the heart of it, keeping consistent perhaps with the kinds of ideas we've been talking about, unity, walking the faith you know, consistently, family. How does the family deal with conflict? 
Might we start with you once again, Your Eminence? Yes. Uh, the beginning statement I made, uh, second on the, you know, establish the basis, kind of the basis, the foundations, mm -hmm. incidentally also becomes the appeal for motivation. Mm. Okay, because of what we are, when we get into a situation we want to settle this, we appeal to that. That's what we did in Davos. The nations gathered together, we needed to come to an agreement. And what is the thing that drives us to want to come to an agreement? Because essentially, we belong to the one family. And the earth is our common home. Mm -hmm. This becomes a motivation. So what was a principle of our origins in difficult times or in times of need also becomes a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. That drives us to a solution. Mm -hmm. The thing about division, again, in the light of the principles that I was talking about, foundations, uh, it, is, it also belongs to the stuff that this story about creation that we read in Genesis very soon talks about the entrance of sin. Okay, it talks about some entering the situation which ruptures relationship. Mm -hmm. First between man and God, between man and man, Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, and then between even humanity and the earth, which is supposed to sustain its life. Mm -hmm. So this reality we call sin is the source of fracturing. This manifests itself in the lives of individuals. He talked about arrogance, but that's not the only manifestation of the sinfulness in the lives of the human person. So uh, sinfulness becomes a big factor and leads to ruptures and ruptures and ruptures. And if we're going to stay beyond this, we will call, our tradition will call for a conversion. Mm -hmm. They need to recognize what this does to our lives, mm -hmm. and they need to want to repair mm -hmm. this and stay beyond this. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, our traditions, yes, they do know of, uh, of this. So in the Catholic Church, we know, yes. uh, you know, for, for the most current division or fracture and that, which very many of you in this room would be uh, you know, knowledgeable about is that thing about Protestantism and, uh, and, and, Cat and Catholicism. Okay, when under Martin Luther, there was a fracture. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had the Protestant church, and then within the Protestant church, the fracturing continued. So there's the Methodist, there's the Anglican, there's the Presbyterian. So the fracture is a process that goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? Once this manifestation of sin is taking place to break us all up, the only way we can deal with it is by dialoguing. Mm -hmm. Through dialogue, recognizing and establish their common roots and fermentation, we have to still bring us together. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to dialogue, we recognize what we may all have done wrong, mm -hmm. and then be open to ask for pardon for each other and begin to get reconciled where we have hurt each other. Mm -hmm. It is in this process that we begin to heal relationship and begin to fashion unity and our common lives together again. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, I, I would agree, superbia, pride. Um, Dante put it at the top, though, so at the, at the Mount Purgatorio. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say that the, the human being is, is, we're a triune creature. Um, we, we, we have a, a, a reptilian stem in evolutionary psychology. It's, it's at the base. It's survival, mm -hmm. fear, instincts. And then we have this midbrain, which we share with dogs, have emotions. We've got dogs in America on Prozac um, because they get depressed <laughs> in families that are kind of depressing. Um, and, and then we have this neocortex, which, which is riding over these two. Now, in, in, in a traditional scheme, like Plato would have said, the whole purpose is for that rational brain to control the irascible, the concupiscent, these lower selves. Mm -hmm. And if we look at this triune self, you know, human beings do basically three things. We know things, we do things, and we make things. And this, this was the understanding. One of the things C.S. Lewis said that, that he, he, he lamented the loss of a holistic view of the world that the ancients had. Mm -hmm. the, the moderns have become fragmented because we fragmented knowing, doing, and making. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why we were meant to know the truth, we were meant to do the good, and we were meant to make the beautiful. Mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 and, and this is, is a holistic way of viewing the world. Um, I don't think you can get a better definition than for happiness, which is what ultimately people apparently are all looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, happiness is, is the soul's conformity. It's, it's the soul's activity and conformity with virtue. Mm -hmm. So 
all of our religious traditions are calling us to be virtuous. Last night we had an exercise where everybody was told to imagine the person most uh, influencing in their lives and then imagine a quality that defined that person. There were probably about 100 people in the room maybe. Every single one of them gave a virtue, yes. mm -hmm. right? That, that, that was what they saw. They didn't say, oh, he went to Harvard and had a uh, 4.0 degree, or he made a billion dollars, or he invented a, a rocket that got us to Mars. It, it, was, it was compassion, humility, mm -hmm. equanimity, uh, love, wisdom. These, these are the things that really all of our societies have cultivated. And I think one of the things, we're the first human society that exploits the seven cardinal sins. Mm -hmm. You know, other societies really saw that you need to help people get over these things. You know, we obey your thirst, mm -hmm. you know, not control your thirst. Just do it, right? Within the institutions, and there, this is, uh, there are many, many institutions within Islam, but with, uh, from your own perspective, how is conflict dealt with well, within the institution? I mean, obviously not very well right now, <laughs> right? But uh, conflict, you know, the, the Quran talks constantly about uh, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mandela was successful because of the truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. the idea of bringing people together. Um, and and, and that, that is something I think that the Muslim world is grappling with. But when, when you look at the, the Muslim world today, what you're seeing is the absence of the practice of the principles of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing the practices. Mm -hmm. uh, the Quran constantly says, do not uh, go into sex to love one another, to treat people, and all of humanity. We have a, a famous tradition. I've got two ayatollahs in the room, but we have a famous tradition from Ali that said that all of humanity can be divided into two types, either your, your, your fellow in religion mm -hmm. or your peer in humanity. Mm. And, and uh, the great poet Hafiz said, um, how would you treat others if you realized that you were all invited by the Creator to a banquet and each one was a guest? Mm -hmm. How would you treat them? Mm -hmm. You know, what right do we have to oppress other people mm -hmm. right. or to denigrate or look down on other people? Mm -hmm. So institutions, uh, we need to learn from our religions. The Catholic institution has been incredible in, in uh, navigating uh, modernity in many ways. It's, it's, it's survived uh, intact for centuries. Yeah. Um, Pascal reminded us that governments don't last, and history proves that. Uh, we, you know, we don't know how long these governments are going to last, but if history is any indication, they won't last forever. Mm -hmm. But he said the reason, but religions do last. The institution of religion lasts. And he said the reason for that is that the ground of politics is compromising principles, but the ground of religion mm -hmm. is principle. Mm. So I think we really need to examine the role of the institution. What do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's what the people of the world are also looking at. Mm -hmm. what, what is it to be a leader? Mm -hmm. And what does that comprise? In the Baha'i conception, a leader is really a servant. You're serving the community. It's not about, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a top-down approach that we have. Right. We don't have clergy in the Baha'i faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if uh, the Baha'is are dissatisfied with the way things are being handled, well, there'll be an election in a year. Mm -hmm. And the, those that are serving the community will be you know, replaced by somebody else. Uh, by election, we are not permitted to electioneer and stand for elections. There's none of that. It's just a very prayerful process where the members of the community come together and write down nine names of individuals, men and women in their community that they think are capable of serving the needs of the community. And then the ones that receive the most votes are the ones that are elected. And um, every five years, we have an international body that's elected too. So I think there's a, a great deal of importance on the role of institutions uh, that Baha'is place, but we also believe that if uh, religion in itself becomes the cause of disunity, it's better not to have that religion. Mm -hmm. Disunity, dissension, whatever. So, um, because again, as I'd mentioned earlier, the purpose of religion and the purpose of religious institutions mm -hmm. is to help uh, mankind, humankind advance. Mm -hmm. And that is what uh, we, we should all be aspiring to do. Yes. Rather than moving backwards, we are moving forward and trying to bring about a better 
world a better, and as we have a better understanding, I mean, we are advancing in science, so too, why not, in our conceptions of how to uh, promote well-being yes. for our communities. Right. And Christiana, could you share with us there's been any examples that come to mind of, of specific situations where you felt stuck? or you were dealing with a situation that was just, it felt somewhat intractable. And faith of some kind, whether the kind you were talking about that were with every day or faith of a, of a, of a deeper kind, um, helped to move that situation forward. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, there were many of them. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but you see, I'm a trained anthropologist. Mm. And so for me, differences, I just thrive on differences. Mm. That is the beauty of this fantastic planet. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, every time that I saw myself in a very difficult situation, I always reminded myself, I have a choice. And it's about making a choice. I can choose to see difficulties, whether it is the difference between me and someone else that I have in front of me, or whether I am witnessing and trying to bring two people together. Uh, there is always a choice about whether you see that difference of position, of economic interest, or anything else, whether you see that as leading to conflict, or whether you see that difference uh, as actually leading to a fascinating exploration mm. of the differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a choice. Right. That is the attitude that you bring toward what you are witnessing or what you are in the middle of. Mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly, it's a choice that we make almost every minute of the day, yeah. sometimes with huge consequences and sometimes with smaller consequences. But it is a constant choice. It is the attitude with which you see everything that is out there. If you see it as actually life is happening for me mm -hmm. to teach me something new that I didn't know, or is life happening against me? Right. Or, so it is, it's very much of a choice, and once you make the choice, to be enriched by differences, to be enriched by challenges, mm -hmm. then there is an unlimited number of lessons um, that can be learned, and your life is all the richer for it, not diminished by it in, in any case. Yes, so you have faith in humanity and a curiosity, deep curiosity that helps to move you forward in certain kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Brian, what's your take? How does faith play more specifically into the work you do, your own life? Talk personal. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> yes. No. So, well, I'm a quantitative sociologist. That's so perfect. I, You're just I, the one who interrogate yeah, them. I, I, yeah, I study religion as an economist would study the society. Study society. Yeah. Um, now, I do that because I care about faith deeply, and I'm a Catholic and uh, used to be a Baptist, and that's sort of what gets me interested in religious freedom. Yeah. I've exercised it in my own life. And so taking those skills and looking at religion, um, I did a study that looked at the socioeconomic contribution of faith in American society. This could be done in any country. And the, at the very basic level, we begin, you know, not at the Vatican, which is a very, you know, meaningful, important institution, but at the local congregation. Mm -hmm. And there, across the United States, there are nearly 400,000 local congregations of all faiths, uh, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, all, all different faiths. And the study looked at what they do mm -hmm. and what it's worth. So, uh, you know, how can you, how can you put an economic value on faith? Well, my daughter recently got married in a center city church in Baltimore, and that started off with love, mm -hmm. resulted in marriage. I can tell you exactly how much money that cost. <laughs> <laughs> and how much money went into Center City, Baltimore, right. to, to a, a Catholic church there that wouldn't have gone in if they had gotten married in the country club out, outside. Right. So, uh, so what the study found is that faith groups across the United States, across the world, are engaged in mental health programs at the local congregation. Mm -hmm. They're engaged in jobs programs. They're engaged in programs that help uh, the mentally ill, that help people with HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. In the United States, across congregations of all sorts, there's one HIV AIDS ministry for every 46 people infected with HIV AIDS. Mm. Can you imagine a government trying to put that in place? Yeah. So, so the, all of that has a value, and, and I won't go into the details, but we estimate that the economic contribution of, uh, of the faith sphere to American society is 1.2 
trillion dollars with mm. a T every mm. year. Now, that comes as a surprise to many people, mm. and uh, it was covered by the Guardian newspaper when the study came out. And uh, in that study, 18,000 people shared it, not mm. just viewed it, many more viewed it. Now, that's a statistic. Mm -hmm. When Donald Trump was elected, he, we just came from hearing him speak. When he was elected, that was big news and surprising to many people, maybe shocking to some. Uh, their story was shared only 17,000 times. Mm. So th that faith has a socioeconomic benefit to society was more shocking right. to Guardian readers yes. than it was that Donald Trump was So faith is more popular than Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I have some numbers to... Uh, to I won't to, comment more. You can't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, good. I, you know, so, um, well, first, any any thoughts so uh, far? You can, from you can tag on to this. Yes. <laughs> here, here in the United States, you're familiar with the cereals. Yes. The stuff you take for breakfast. Mm -hmm. yes. Its origin is related to faith and its practice. Mm. The Quakers and those who invented and came <laughs> up with cereals. Quaker oats. <laughs> well, well, you know, because of that, was their religion that led to that inventory. Yes. That invention and the development mm -hmm. of that. That's Secondly, lately uh, in our South Africa, didn't used to have an embassy to the Vatican. Mm. So one gentleman who is now the ambassador uh, <laughs> brought this to the government and they thought, you know, what use is this? So he went back and did just what he talked about. <laughs> he, he, he went and studied the contribution of the church to the South African society. Mm -hmm. And when he came to Parliament and showed them the figures, yeah. they said, go. <laughs> so, so that's how now there is a South African ambassador. Right. This on a lighter note. Yeah. South African ambassador in the Vatican. Yes. Their contribution, I mean, you know, uh, the faith inspiring people to do things, even with economic effect and implications, mm -hmm. so very many. Right. Well, but, yeah. I, 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 you know, also, I mean, I think it's really important to point out that a lot of what we cherish about uh, modernity, about individual rights, the inalienable rights, human dignity, all these things, mm -hmm. these, these come out of uh, Christian Western civilization. I mean, this idea, in many ways, modernity is a, a Christian heresy, yeah. just simply because it removed God, but it retained a lot of the principles. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something modern Westerners tend to really forget, how much religion informed that. Mm -hmm. And then also the participation of religion in, look, credit unions were, were faith-based. They came out of a, a faith-based tradition in Germany and then in America and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, life insurance was a Catholic initiative to protect families that uh, suddenly lost a, a, a provider. Uh, the, the, the evangelicals were the ones that eliminated uh, the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. William Wilberforce in Parliament was entirely informed by his faith. Mm -hmm. So we forget all of these things. But mm -hmm. I would say one of the most important things about faith, I mean, I, as, as somebody who studied theology, I'm very committed to reasonable faith. But there's also satisfactory dogma. You know, there's this, there's this idea that people get a great deal out of faith. You know, Marx is often quoted saying religion is the opiate of the masses. Mm -hmm. But he didn't actually say that. It's a completely misinterpretation of what he said. Mm -hmm. What he said was, is that religion is a protest against an unjust world. Mm -hmm. That religion is the sigh of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. It's the heart of a heartless world. Mm -hmm. It's the soul of soulless conditions. Mm -hmm. It is the opiate. It's the opium of the people. Mm -hmm. In other words, it numbs the pain of living in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, we have replaced religion with real opium. We have an opium crisis in America because people have such a hard time dealing with religion. Now, I think if Marx was writing today, he prob probably would not have said religion is the opiate of the masses. He would have said something like, um, Facebook is the heart of a heartless world. Mm -hmm. um, that Netflix is the opium of the, of the mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're in a different type of, of world. But I think faith, we forget how much faith enables people yeah. to navigate. I mean, Buddhism, the first mm -hmm. truth of Buddhism is the world is suffering, right? right? And, and people forget that, that there is great suffering in the world and religion has always been yeah. a, a source of solace for people. So Marx's idea was, look, instead of having religion, let's just get rid of the suffering suffering in the world, which is a utopian idea that ended up killing millions of people. So faith has a practical component to it, and that may in fact be measurable. Yes. Christiana. I, I just wanted to add, if I'm, I'm assuming that we have to close very soon, that um, when we talk about faith in the fractured world, I think it's important to remember, although we have these three fantastically distinguished leaders of institutionalized religions, mm -hmm. that when most people think about faith, the gamut is much broader. 
it is either those who are part of these um, institutionalized religions, mm -hmm. and it goes all the way to people who feel that they are on a spiritual path of self-discovery mm -hmm. that not necessarily is in right. any of the traditional religions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is equally as important. Mm -hmm. So I think we should keep in mind that this is fortunately for all of us, a very, very wide gamut. Mm -hmm. And the wider we make it, uh, the more inclusive it can mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. and the more healing it can bring. And I hear you saying, mm -hmm, unity. <laughs> How's this connect, Bonnie? Uh, How does that resonate with you? Very well. And that's, that's uh, something that we believe that, you know, young people are being, um, <clears throat> Again, we hear that young people are being alienated and they're turning away from organized religion, etc. However, I think we, uh, what young people are yearning is a sense of purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And where there is, I think, Islamic relief worldwide, I've heard them talk about how their young people are doing a lot more in the field and you know going out and serving and there's, there's a lot of energy there. Mm -hmm. They may not be sitting in the mosques. And, likewise with the churches and other communities as well. So I think there is this search and we have to learn to be inclusive and reach out to, to everybody because I think faith is a very deep, it's, it's what makes us human. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction between you know, the animal <coughs> world and us because we have the comprehension to understand. And, um, and I think it's really important that we be reaching out to everyone. Mm -hmm. In terms of unity, I have to throw out a, a, a quote at this point, and the, it's from the Baha'i writings, and the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. And I think it is that sense of unity that we need to be inculcating in order to arrive at this peaceful world that everyone's looking to build. And, and our time is ticking, you were right. <laughs> we have about 10 minutes left, and I really want to learn more. Uh, I, could have, I, I could get lost in this conversation, we could go for hours, uh, except everybody would have to leave. Uh, um, the, uh, no, I think we all struggle in our own personal lives. This is being video cast as well. Every person watching this we know is a human being who has some pain, who has some suffering. Uh, so the divisiveness is very internal, as much as it might be global as well. Mm -hmm. What's your advice? You know, in a, a minute or two's worth of thinking, what is your advice to all of us on how we might deal with that internal pain, that suffering, whether it's a family fracture, I, sh I won't use that word, family division, mm -hmm. whether it is you know, a, a conflict you've gotten in with a friend on a political issue, how do we personally deal with these things? What's your advice or your guidance to all of us? And I open it up to any of you. Please. I'll jump in. Please. Um, so something that's not well known, uh, the, the organization is, but its principles aren't, is Alcoholics Anonymous in the United States and, and worldwide. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's recommended by health providers as, as the best, one of the best hopes for people who are addicted to not only alcohol but other addictions to have recovery. Mm -hmm. What's not well known is that of their 12-step principles, about eight of them involve God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a religious organization. I mean, it comes out of uh, uh, people with Christian experience. But they bring people in, and the first three steps uh, are you know, recognizing you have a problem mm -hmm. and then recognizing there's somebody above who cares, mm. God, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't let people go past those three steps. You know, later on, it's reconciliation and getting your life back in order. Mm -hmm. But the very first step is, hi, I'm Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. you, know, that, that, you probably have seen that in TV shows, or maybe some of you have been to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. So that is the beginning stage, is recognizing we've got a problem, mm -hmm. and then faith has solutions that are missing from many other things. And people, people lose, the, you know, people often drop out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know some about this because my next 
quantitative study is studying the value of, men, of faith communities to addressing addiction mm. and mental health issues. Mm. So I'm looking into this. And, mm. and what they do is that they, they really understand that if you don't reconnect with each other mm -hmm. and reconnect with God as you see him, and it might not even just be a spiritual force, like you were saying, it might not be an organized faith, but they mm. begin there. So I think that there's, there's faith is mm. addressing a lot of problems, and mm. many of us aren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, till I started this study, I wasn't aware of how faith imbued Alcoholics Anonymous. So when we are struggling, when we feel lost, remember faith as a potential guiding source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, 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 any, any of you, please. Yeah, I, I, I can Oops, jump everybody. Well, that, that was bad um, facilitation on my part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all, please, Christiana. And, uh, yes, why don't we maybe go this direction? Um, I, I must say I have been struggling with a deep personal pain for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm sure I'm not the only human being uh, who is in that situation. And so your, your question is quite pertinent. And um, for me, in, in my spiritual growth, uh, which follows the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, the Buddhist master. What I have learned, or what I'm still trying to learn, because I have to relearn it about every minute of my life, is that those situations of pain that are present in our life are very fertile ground for learning. Mm -hmm. And that there never is a pain, there never is a difficulty that is present for us from which we cannot learn, if we choose to do so. Mm -hmm. if we, but it's a choice. We can either decide that we're victims of it, mm -hmm. and the world is unfair, he, she, it, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is unfair to me, and you know, poor little me, I'm never gonna get out of this hole. Mm -hmm. Or we can decide to look at this and say, what is the lesson that is trying to emerge out of that for me. Mm -hmm. And learning that lesson, you enrich yourself and are better <coughs> equipped to understand others who are in very similar situations. Thich Nhat Hanh has a beautiful way of saying that. And he says, no mud, no lotus. Mm -hmm. Because the lotus flowers grow in mm -hmm. the mud. And if you don't have any mud, if you don't have anything to struggle with, mm -hmm. you will never be able to bloom a lotus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be grateful for the mud yes. because we can all harvest a lotus. Right. So suffer more today. Yes. <laughs> bloom the lotus. No, bloom the lotus. That's much more appropriate. Yes. Please. You know, the Persians have a teaching story about a man who went to a doctor and he said, Doctor, I touch here and I have all this pain. I touch here, I have all this pain. Here, I have all this pain. Mm -hmm. Everywhere there's pain. What's wrong with me? He examined me and he said, Your finger's broken. <laughs> <laughs> and and sometimes, you know. The, the meaning behind that, obviously, is, is we need to identify the source of the pain and the suffering where it comes from. And, and a lot of people uh, don't know where their pain comes from. Melancholia can be uh, intrinsic. Uh, you know, there's exogenous, where your father dies and you have pain. Mm -hmm. But there's also a, a type of inward pain and suffering. And, and in our tradition, we actually believe that, that that's part of the design. Mm -hmm. And that pain is to drive you uh, to seek solace. And, and the only solace that you will find is in truth. Mm. And, and so it's, um, you know, one, one of the, uh, the verses in the, well, the relationship of pain and knowledge is in the Arabic word, ilm and alam. They're actually cognates, so, so they're related to each other. Mm. Immense learning comes out of suffering, and we believe in redemptive suffering. The idea, there's two ways to look at the world, and both have a lot of evidence. One is that this is meaningless, randomless madness, and, and we'll all just do, you know, John Lennon said, whatever gets you through the night, mm -hmm. you know. And then the other is that it's meaningful and it's purposeful, and I have a meaning, and I as an individual have purpose, and I'm in a universe of purpose, mm -hmm. that each individual that comes into my life has a purpose and meaning. Those are two choices, and there's not enough time to sit around and debate about it. I, for me personally, I made my choice, um, but like I said, they both have arguments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once again, choice, mm -hmm. choice and the value of choosing. Please, your minutes. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I think I think I think like a, like a, like a ship or a boat on a storm tossed sea, mm -hmm. you always need a keel. That's tears that keeps the uh, you know, ship balanced on the stormy waters and keeps going. And I think that's the role of fate in the lives of human beings. Mm -hmm. we, we all need to be killed into something. Mm -hmm. That stabilizes us, 
that drives us and that gives us an orientation in everything that we do. And that kind of faith, again, and he's talking about choice, it's a fundamental option. Mm -hmm. He said he's made that choice, and you know, that's the way that, that's a fundamental option. In our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our tradition, it's a fundamental option to commit oneself in relationship to a personal God, mm -hmm. a personal God who is good and loving. It's not, it's not, it's not you know, committing oneself to anything, but to a personal entity who is good and loving and who is displayed or manifested this. So uh, the faith uh, is very fundamental. I, you know, I recognize what uh, Sheikh said at the, uh, Yusuf huh, said at the beginning, manifest different forms of faith, like we all have come here to Davos, trusting that we're going to be here, and that's an act of faith. We eat, mm. we, you know, it's an act of faith. Those are acts of faith, manifestations of faith. But they're all rooted in a more fundamental faith, which orients our being mm. to, in this case as a Christian, mm. to a personal God, okay, who is loving and all. And it is this relationship which inspires order types of relationship and other activities and functions of my life. So if I should get into a difficult situation or whatever, you know, whatever mm -hmm. I, know, I know how to orient that. Mm -hmm. I know how to orient that. And so it's not a ship storm tossed on the sea, not knowing where to go. Have a, there is a keel mm -hmm. to my life. And that keel to my life, and that can be the key to anybody's life, is this faith commitment. In a personal being who's good and who's loving and who's interested in, mm -hmm. in me, yeah. basically that's uh, that, that's that's you know a thing about this uh, alcoholic or anonymous you know uh, type of thing. This is this is the presentation. Mm -hmm. This is what faith actually in this uh, type of thing does mean radically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to 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 me as a guide in one's life. Yes. And our time is just about up. Is there any final thought that's been burning on your mind that you'd like to share before we close? We have about three minutes. Well, I think the, the underlying concept is love and not uh, treating mm. the other as the other. Mm -hmm. And I think we are living in a world where there's this <coughs> tendency to, to get nervous when, when you know, we, we are living at a time when there are other communities, the world is getting smaller and people are coming in, etc. and there's this tendency to close in. Mm -hmm. And um, as Brian mentioned, the Alcoholics Anonymous program is one of those great equalizers yeah. uh, where you could be the wealthiest man or the person really from Skid Row and you're there together and the, there's one common fraternity which gets you through this illness, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. and, but at the core of that is the concept of love. And we have to love each other and love mankind. And that is the only thing that's going to unite us. I think that is a beautiful place to close for the moment. Uh, I, I, I just in reflection upon hearing and learning from your, your, your perspectives, there's so much noise in our world. <laughs> There's so much noise that we are facing every day. <laughs> How do we find that guidance on this boat of life? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you've more than reminded us, I think you've deepened our understanding. For me, you've given me a lot to think about as I go to sleep tonight <laughs> and call my family and say, I love you kids, I miss you. you know? <laughs> uh, so Good really, you. <laughs> thank you all so very much. It's a true honor to be here today with you. Would you join me in a show of gratitude to <laughs> our eminent guests?